One of the things when you look at just the straight law and read the uh, FDA, uh, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act uh, and, and do it from an intellectual perspective, you can have the view that Paul Kalb has that uh, there are these uh, truthful, non-misleading speech that should be gotten out to the doctors and that there's no other way for them to get it. What we see on the prosecution side is, and when we do these investigations of pharmaceutical companies, is that that's not where the facts take us. And that's not what we're learning as we do the in-depth investigation that the FDA cannot do, that we do as prosecutors. And what is it that we see that causes us to be upset about what we're looking at inside pharmaceutical companies? We see false and misleading speech is a, a regular course of activity among many of the pharmaceutical companies that we have prosecuted. and and. Uh, to give you an example, and both in medical devices and pharmaceutical companies, they are uh, required to stay on label in, in terms of promotion. And what Paul says about doctors being able to prescribe off label, that's absolutely true. And there are all kinds of forums for doctors to get untainted scientific information, independent, truly independent, continuing medical, edu uh, medical education, like what you do here doctors can do with other doctors. There are ways to get the information to them. But what we see happening and what is prohibited is drug manufacturers who make their money based on the sales of the product going out and marketing off-label. And why do we care? Let me just give you a couple of examples. We've, we've been promised that we can talk about facts later because sometimes they don't want us to talk about the facts. Uh, in, in the Serono case, for example, that we did in Boston, uh, there were off-label uses. Uh, there was a medical device that did not have approval of the FDA. It was a computer program that was specifically not approved by the FDA to determine uh, body mass in AIDS patients. And why was that? In the, initially, it was because they wanted to change the rules about how body mass was determined determined within the patients. And the reason they did it, and the reason they went out without FDA approval, we were able to show, is because they wanted to convince AIDS patients that they were dying of a wasting disease that they did not have in order to increase sales of a drug, serostum, that cost those AIDS patients $20,000 a course, one single course of treatment. So these AIDS patients thought they had wasting disease, and they did not. And it was a design by a drug company to sell its drug by using a medical product that had not been approved by the FDA and for which the FDA had expressly refused to change the definition of, of body mass index the way Serona wanted it to do. I get offended by that. The judge who handled the case got offended by that. Uh, this is the kind of conduct that we see and we bring cases on. We don't bring them on the close to the line cases, at least that's our, our view. We're looking for the cases where, where the pharmaceutical companies puts their thumb on the science. You know, it, arguably, and I'm supposed to be doing here just the, the set piece, so let me go back to that for a minute, uh, but it is the facts that drive our passion on the government side for why we continue to do these cases and push hard on them. Uh, because the drug companies are, there's nothing wrong with the pursuit of profits, but when they do it at the expense of patients and at the expense of the truth, when they put their finger on the science and only report out the science that's in their favor and suppress the negative studies, when that's the kind of science we get out of drug companies, we can't trust them. And our doctors can't make the independent medical judgments that we want and expect them to make based on the evidence because the evidence in science is what they would be making the, the um, decisions on if they got accurate information from the drug companies. And that's why we care uh, to the extent we do. The only thing let me say about the range of options that we have on the government side, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act is one tool, and it does have both felonies and misdemeanors available. Uh, we also take these cases under much more traditional criminal theories, mail fraud, wire fraud, health care fraud, uh, conspiracy to defraud, because when there are false and misleading statements involved, we don't need to go to the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act with all its complexities. We can just do garden variety fraud cases. Uh, we can also sometimes, when the cases are um, less serious, 
uh, use a set of civil remedies. Under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, we can use civil disgorgement. Uh, there's a Civil False Claims Act for federal government programs, and sometimes we use those as well as different sort of alternatives for, for coming at and weighing different kinds of conduct. And often, this is a good way to transition into uh, Tom, uh, those cases and the uh, information about the cases are often brought to us by whistleblowers, and Tom represents whistleblowers, so I will let him Excuse me, Tom, before you proceed, Susan, uh, just a quick oh. word about your coordination with the Medicaid fraud. Oh, and and, and bef before I do any of that, uh, I was reminded by my state counterpart, because this is very important for both him and I, uh, I, all the views expressed today are my personal views. They do not represent the views of the U.S. Attorney's Office or the Department of Justice, and or not necessarily, they may or may not. <laughs> Uh, and the other one is, please bear with me, I cannot talk about pending matters, whether they are investigations or cases. Uh, so there are many things out there that are very interesting, but that I'm prohibited from talking about, and I just needed to get that on the record. And as for the Medicaid Fraud Control Units, uh, one of the things we do when we do investigations on the federal side, we have the advantage with the grand jury of doing national federal investigations, and um, often we often these cases are resolved on the federal side before they ever reach court and we have a, a global resolution of both a, a criminal plea and sentencing and um, and the civil side which includes on the states the medicaid fraud control units who represent their state medicaid um, monies and and the the medicaid program is both federal and state money so we'll resolve the federal part and the state medicaid groups provide a team they find the information for us, uh, supply it to us. We work with them collaboratively, and they, and then often the state Medicaids are also resolved, sometimes with exceptions. We have a couple of very active states. Texas office often likes to litigate on their own. Sometimes New York will do the same thing. So there are a few states that are often bring and are in advance of the federal resolution on the Medicaid side. Uh, separate and apart from the consumer protection side, which David will tell you about in just a minute. 